Accounting Equation and Excel. Record transaction for the purchase of furniture and investing in stocks and bonds. Get ready and some coffee because we're going to learn the accounting foundation, the accounting equation using Excel. Here we are in Excel. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty, to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. So if you don't have access to this workbook, that's okay because we basically built this from a blank worksheet, but started in a prior presentation. So if you want to build this entire worksheet from a blank sheet, you may want to begin back there, or you could just construct your own worksheet as we go, or possibly just follow along with good old paper and pencil. If you do have access to this workbook, workbook though there's three tabs down below example practice blank example in essence the answer key the practice tab having pre-formatted cells so you can practice the practice problem with less excel formatting the blank tab the one we will be working on is where we started with a blank worksheet but are basically working within a template at this time adding to the template as needed as we go let's go to the example tab to get an idea of what we're going to be doing this time we started off entering our transactions from what we're imagining was the prior accounting system that we're going to start at this point in time then we added two transactions which are common when we start a new business that being for the capital financing of the business because we don't have any money yet in order to buy the equipment which is often needed the startup costs in order to consume that equipment to generate revenue therefore the two ways we typically get paid from the beginning or get the money is from us the owner putting money into the business to then buy the equipment or from a loan so that was, that's what we did last time now that we have that money we're gonna do the next step. We're gonna take the money and buy the things that we need to buy, which will help us to generate revenue in the future. That's typically gonna be equipment. Like if you're a landscaper or something like that, you're gonna need possibly a truck and landscaping tools and whatnot. And uh, if you're in some industries, however, note that there's lower startup costs. So if you're, in, if you're doing online YouTube or something like that, or social media, uh, uh, talking and whatnot then all you really need is a camera and a microphone which can get expensive but it's a lot less of a startup cost oftentimes than because you can do it almost with your phone although again depends how sophisticated the equipment is going to be but if you're doing other things such as landscaping or something like that you're going to need the equipment for it and that's going to be a higher startup uh, costs notice that the startup costs are can be good and can be bad because low startup costs mean that there's typically going to be a lot of competition because people are going to be doing that possibly on the side and whatnot because there's not a lot of cost to enter that market. Higher startup costs mean there's a lot more skin in the game and therefore likely to have less participation from others, meaning less competition possibly and those types of industries which could lead to more opportunity for people willing to throw the money in. But Again, there's pros and cons on both those sides. You have the risk of losing the money, of course. But now that we have the money, we're going to be buying, in our case, furniture. So we're going to buy the furniture, which is similar to buying any kind of property, plants, and equipment, depending on this industry that we are in. So let's go on over and see what that looks like. Now, before we do the furniture, we're actually going to do another transaction as well. Remember that I, freezed, I froze the panes. So that's in cell A4. I went to the View tab 
and I froze the panes so that when I scroll down, I still have the header up top. Now we're also gonna do a transaction for investing some of the money. So we have 140,000 in cash right now. So the first thing we're gonna imagine doing is putting some of that money into an investment, that investment being like stocks and bonds we are imagining. Now, a couple things I wanna point out about this. Uh, one is that normally for most businesses, if you have a landscaping business, or in our case, we're investing in guitar shop, we're gonna buy and sell guitars and possibly have guitar lessons and whatnot then you're not usually gonna be investing in stocks and bonds within your business if it was a sole proprietorship. Why? Because you're usually gonna take that money, give it to yourself as the owner of the business and invest it in stocks and bonds from there. In other words, your business is not the business of investing stocks and bonds. We're in the business, in our case, of selling guitars and doing guitar lessons. However, so and if we had a lot of cash, for example, if I had this $140,000 of cash and I wasn't gonna invest it in the business because I don't need any more investments in the business in terms of furniture and equipment or inventory, then what I should typically do, and this goes for sole proprietorships, partnerships, corporations, give it to the owner in the form of draws, if it's a sole proprietorship or partnership or dividends so that the owner can do something with it because the business isn't doing anything, anything with it. Now you could say, well, the business could put it into stocks and bonds, but, and that would be fine. You could do that. But again, the business isn't, that's not their objective. That's not how the business is supposed to be generating revenue. The business goal of revenue generation is through the activity of whatever it's designed to do. In our case, selling guitars and doing guitar lessons. And therefore, since, investing is outside the scope, we would take that money and give it to the owner if we're not using it for our business objective. However, you might have some money that you wanna hold on short term. So in other words, we're gonna use this money to invest in inventory and furniture and equipment. We just haven't got around to it yet or possibly we, we don't have enough money built up to buy the big capital investment or something like that. And in that case, we might temporarily park it in like a, an investment type of account so that we could so that we can get some dividends on it or some investment income while we're holding on to it in the short term other one other thing i want to point out is that we've used this term investment a couple different ways meaning we said the owner invested money into the uh, business that is an investment from the owner because the owner is putting money in to buy basically ownership interest or in order for the business to be able to then buy stuff to generate revenue such as the uh, inventory and the furniture and equipment. Now I'm also using the term investment more specifically, which is often what people usually think of when they hear investment, that is investing in like stocks and bonds more passive income type of investment. So we wanna keep those two things separate in our mind because we will end up using them interchangeably. In other words, all the assets in the business are basically investments, right? Meaning if I buy inventory, property, plant, and equipment, that is us investing money in those things in order to use those things to generate revenue. But we, don't rec we record them on the books as an asset of inventory and furniture and equipment. Here I'm talking about investments in investment type assets like, like uh, the stocks and bonds, passive income generating assets. Okay, so let's do that. So we're gonna just say this is gonna be one four. This is also a transaction that doesn't happen all that often for businesses that aren't in the business of passive uh, revenue generation. It would only happen periodically, right? Because it would only happen when we have that extra cash that we'd be putting money into and out of. Therefore, we're not gonna have like an automatic process set up, meaning if you're using bank feeds and like a QuickBooks or a zero, you're not typically gonna have a saved transaction for investing money in stocks and bonds because it's not something that you're typically gonna be doing all the time unless your business is set up as an investment type of business as its primary objective for revenue generation. All right invest we're going to say this is going to invest some money in stocks we're going to say stocks and bond let's say we put twelve thousand. so we're going to take twelve thousand out of cash 
So the cash is going to go down. And then the other side is going to go into uh, short-term investments. So I'm going to call this then just short-term investments. And I'm going to put it over here next to uh, the inventory. So I'm going to select the entire P column, add another account, right-click and insert. And that should give us another column over here, which I'm going to call short-term term investments. Now, something else just to keep in mind, uh, you might be in recording something like a QuickBooks or a Xero for your personal investments, uh, for your personal bookkeeping, in which case you might be dealing with short-term investments like investing in 401k plans and so on and so forth. Realize that QuickBooks is not designed or your accounting system usually is not designed to track the, the short-term gains and losses from a whole big array of different investment types like different stocks and so on and so forth it's usually there for like a summary in other words you want to summarize in some way your short-term investment possibly not breaking out every kind of business that you're investing stocks and bonds within tracking that more detailed information possibly with the use of other software like financial uh software you, you might get like well in any case uh, but I won't get into that now. Or you can track it basically on the investment website if you're using investment people like a Vanguard or an E-Trade or something like that. And then you're summarizing it here in your accounting system. Otherwise, you're going to have a whole bunch of accounts uh, breaking out all the different types of investments. You might break it out into short term and long term or you might break it out uh, into those investments that are under a 401k plan if it was a personal investment versus those that are not under a 401k plan, which would be kind of like short term and long term from the personal side. But uh, that's just a quick side note. So there's going to be our transaction. So I'm just going to put zeros across the board, short term investments going up, cash going down, net impact on assets. One asset goes up, the other asset goes down. Why would we do that then if assets are not changing? Because we're hoping to get some return on our uh, investment. Let's put a uh, an underline under this last one because I didn't do that last time. I want an underline. And then I'm gonna copy this down. Nothing happened to assets even though two assets accounts were impacted because one went up, the other went down. Therefore across the board, no change. The new balance then, if I sum this up, equals the sum we've got 140,000 minus the 12,000 brings our cash down to 128 I'm going to copy that and paste it across the board across the board and pasting it just the formulas only just the formulas por favor and then I'll put an underline above it so we have the underline here so we'll put that in play and there's the underline let's copy down our total to make sure that we are once again in balance on the total we should be because there was no change everything is zero that red should turn green when we copy it on down all right let's do the next one where we're going to say that we're going to now buy furniture and equipment so i put some of this money into investment and now i'm investing in the, some other of it in furniture and equipment so we're going to be purchasing buy furniture with cash so we're just going to spend cash buying furniture that means cash is going to go down wait how much did we pay let's say it's sixteen thousand. cash is going to go down by 16,000 and the other side is once again going to be an asset this time it being into the long term or fixed assets property plant and equipment so there is the property plant and equipment once again one asset goes down the other asset goes up this also being a transaction that doesn't happen all the time in accounting software so then if you were to record things automatically using something like bank feeds you're not usually gonna have a transaction that's gonna be able to automatically record the purchase of equipment, even if you're using bank feeds, because 
it's not a transaction that happens on a daily basis. It only happens basically periodically. What you have to be careful of, however, is that when we purchase furniture and equipment, we don't accidentally put it into an expense account because you might be purchasing things like from a supply store, office supplies and so on, that you automatically post to say office supplies expense. But then you buy something large like furniture and equipment from the same place. And if you're not careful, the bank rules that you set up will post that to office supplies when you should be putting in into an asset of furniture and equipment. Now you might say, hey, look, I'm on a cash based system. I just want to record it as an expense when it comes due. You could do that, but just realize that that's you're going to run into problems possibly doing that, especially if you're in the United States and you have to do income taxes because the tax code forces you to put it on the books as an asset, even if you're using a cash based system. And again, this makes sense like if you think about the extreme case. In other words, even if you're on a cash based system, even if the tax code didn't force you to do anything and you bought a building for $100,000, you're probably thinking I shouldn't be expensing $100,000 of building cost even though I paid cash for it because uh, it, it's an asset. I'm gonna be using that building for like 30 years. So intuitively we would say, yeah, that should go on the books as an asset and then possibly depreciate the cost over the useful life as I use it so that my income statement is comparable to other periods rather than having this massive expense building expense, right? Uh, the same thing is true for other large purchases to a lesser extent. If I pay 16,000, you might say, yeah, I could expense that, but it's still same concept. It's a large expense that you're not consuming at the same point in time should put on the books as an asset and then depreciate it over the time that you're using the asset so you have the proper matching uh, principle over here. And the tax code, again, it's gonna kind of force you to do that. So from a practical standpoint, what, what you're also gonna need to do is take these purchases from an income tax perspective in the United States, put them on the tax uh, basis so that you can record proper taxes. That means that when you put this information into tax software, you're gonna need the detailed information. In other words, the furniture and equipment is kind of similar to inventory. With the inventory, when we buy the inventory, we put it on the books and we have a subsidiary ledger tracking the inventory. However, with the furniture and equipment, we often don't track the subsidiary ledger breaking out the actual things we're purchasing, in this case, the units of furniture in like a QuickBooks system or a zero system because the tax software in the United States forces us to do that. And we have to follow the tax code depreciation schedules, at least for tax purposes. For bookkeeping purposes, we could use the tax depreciation uh, methods use tax law for the depreciation method or we could choose a bookkeeping depreciation which might be straight line or double declining balance either way the tax software will usually be able to handle that therefore we might as well just use their depreciation schedules otherwise we're going to have a duplicate of the data input which is just going to cause likelihood for differences between the two which we don't there's no need to basically do that usually so that's the general idea we will have a sub ledger but it will often be calculated by the tax software so that means that we have to make sure that in this account for furniture and equipment we have the backup information listing out the actual things that we bought in furniture and equipment giving us the serial number if possible or as good a description as we can have so that we can then have the tax software make the subsidiary ledger listing out each of the property plant and equipment items which we can then see and physically locate based on that description in our in our place right we want to be able to physically find all of the furniture and equipment based on the on the schedule also note that if I bought like five pieces of furniture and equipment here, I don't want to put it on the depreciation schedule as one line item of 16,000. Easy to do when I put it on the books, but if I sell the furniture and equipment, let's say I sell one table 
for $5,000 that cost us $5,000, I'm not gonna be able to sell it as easily. I'm gonna have to do something, some more work when I sell it because I had grouped the $5,000 table into the 16,000 that includes five pieces of furniture. So what we wanna do is make sure you're working with a tax preparer that takes the invoice and breaks out each of the pieces of furniture uh, individually, ideally, and gives enough description so that you can actually physically locate the piece of furniture so that when you sell it or dispose of it, you know what you sold and disposed, you know which line item to write off on the subsidiary ledger, and you don't have to basically deal with this grouping problem when you write off uh, those line items. So also just, just that means that for there shouldn't be too many track transactions in furniture and equipment because we don't purchase a whole lot of things. We don't purchase furniture and equipment on a daily basis, in other words. So all of the information that you put into this account, you're typically gonna to wanna to keep the detailed invoices and whatnot so that you can provide those basically to the tax preparer or for yourself to properly record them in uh, the fixed asset schedule is the general idea. Okay, let's put some zeros across the board here. Zeros across the board. No impact on the income statement, not yet. When will we impact the income statement? When we depreciate it, of course. And that will we'll do that periodically. Copying this down, copying this down. Let's put some underlines here. Wait a sec, put some underlines here. I didn't do that last time. Put some underlines here, and then we'll bring down the balance again. Bringing down the balance, no impact to total assets because one asset went up, one asset went down, similar scenario. So let's copy this across, copy it across, pasting it with just the formulas only, pasting formulas only. Uno vase mas one more time, pasting it with those formulas. Let's put an underline under the one above it, underline, and then we will underline, and one more time with the good old underline. All right, let's do it again. Same thing. We're gonna buy another more furniture. We're buying more furniture. So I'm gonna say this happened on one eleven. We're gonna buy furniture with cash again. $7,000. Wait a sec, I should copy the balance down before, don't get ahead of yourself. Copy the balance down, make sure we're still in balance. It should be the same totals because, and that goes back in balance. All right, there we have it. Let's put an underline there. All right, so same thing once again. So once again, we're gonna buy more furniture. Cash is gonna go down 7,000. We're gonna have the furniture and equipment's gonna go up by the lump sum of 7,000, but I'm gonna keep the invoice making sure that the subsidiary ledger, which I'm gonna do in outside software, the tax software oftentimes will have broken out each individual piece of furniture. Now also just realize that this furniture and equipment account, the groupings of our fixed assets, because we're using a subsidiary ledger in say tax software, we wanna talk to the tax preparer or look at our tax software to see what the grouping, the best grouping of, for, of fixed assets will be. In other words, like I, I, wanna, I want my subsidiary ledger to tie out to my summary accounts on my bookkeeping. So I don't really wanna be breaking out like computer and equipment versus like chairs versus desks versus trucks and then cars because the, the software on the tax side probably isn't gonna have all of those different categories, right? The software for taxes is probably gonna be categorized in terms of just furniture and equipment or furniture and fixture versus uh, equipment and automobiles and then buildings and, uh, and land, right? Or something like that. So I wanna tie in, generally I wanna tie into those same subcategories as my overarching categories here. So it will be easy for me to record the periodic 
uh, accumulated depreciation by category and then tie out to the to the to the ledgers uh, in the, the summary ledgers that are in the software. Otherwise, I'm going to have to add things together and add multiple categories together to match out the other categories and so on and so forth. So just be careful with the furniture and fixture. We'll talk more about it a little bit later in terms of the categorizations, but but uh, you want to talk to the tax preparer and, and try to set up your categories as easily as possible because posting to, to fixed assets it's kind of easy to do until you things get complicated, until you get a long list of fixed assets that are grouped in a wacky way and where you have things summarized together and then you try to sell things or dispose of things and you can't locate them and you have these grouping problems so that you can't dispose of them properly on the subsidiary ledger. Okay, that's enough ranting on that. It's painful, I'm telling you. You don't wanna, you don't wanna, do that you want to measure twice cut once this is not a tinkering situation get it right the first time measure twice cut will cut once with this thing tinkering's okay but not here this is not where to tinker do it right the first time do it right the first time okay otherwise it causes you problems all right let's do uh, let's bring down the balance equals the sum and we'll copy the sum those down and uh oh, what was that? Que okay, So I'm going to copy that and then we'll paste that across. Pasting it formulas only. Pasting it formulas only. Pasting it formulas only. Let's put an underline on the one above it. Underline. Underline. And one more time. We want an underline. All right, and then we'll copy the balance down again, ultra vez, one more time, another time, ultra times, and we're back in balance. Put an underline under this one, okay? So I think we have it there. So fairly straightforward on the journal entries, but again, in practice, obviously we just wanna make sure that we're tracking and we keep the invoices. You got the tax register, subsidiary ledger, uh, to track the information, making sure you got that detail on the subsidiary ledger. You want to be able to look at that subsidiary ledger and say, hey, look, there is the serial number or the description of that couch. I know exactly where that couch is. So if I sell the couch, then I can write it off of the subsidiary ledger report. You need the detail. If your tax preparer doesn't put detail in the subsidiary ledger, then you need you need a new tax preparer. He's not doing it right. He ain't doing it right. Get you, anyway, I'll stop.